Okay, here's the list of representative heroes for Lecture 3. We'll finish Giotto's career first, and then hear for most of the rest of the first half of the lecture about Sienese art. The 14th century is, in fact, the greatest in the history of Sienese art. And one could even make a case that more important painting was done in that century in Siena than in Florence. We'll see Duccio's Maestà, sort of the panel painting equivalent to Giotto's arena chapel work in fresco, and then hear about Ambrogio Lorenzetti, Simone Martini, and others who were among the important artists decorating the Palazzo Publico in Siena. After the break, we'll hear about the three greatest figures in Italian literature, in the whole history of Italian literature. They also all come in the 14th century, Donny, Petrarch, and Boccaccio. So here's the presumed self-portrait of Giotto, which we saw at the end of the last lecture in the Arena Chapel. And as I said last time, the most important and most well-documented work by him is there. But some other important things, probably done later than the Arena Chapel, are also attributed to him, including work on the famous mosaic that was once on the facade of the atrium of Old St. Peter's. The story goes that Pope Boniface VIII sent a messenger to ask for a sample of Giotto's work. And since Giotto was busy, and by reputation at least, was not known to be very accommodating even when not busy, he just drew a perfect circle free hand on a piece of paper. When the messenger remarked that that didn't seem like much to show his holiness, Giotto replied that if his holiness knew anything about art, he would recognize genius in that circle. Giotto is thought to have been in Rome during Boniface's reign, but it may well be that the work he is thought to have done on the big mosaic wasn't under undertaken until later, after the arena chapel was finished. It may be that this angel is a fragment of that work. In fact, I don't think Giotto ever drew a perfect circle in his life, and this angel's halo isn't one. Giotto would not have done any of the actual hands-on mosaic work, but only have produced the cartoon for it. When the Frenchman Clement V was elected Pope in 1305, he began the so-called Avignon Captivity and made his residence there, leaving St. Peter's to the custodianship of Cardinal Stefaneschi, a nephew of Boniface VIII, and it is thought by some that this fellow Stefaneschi may have actually commissioned the mosaic in question. In any case, Stefaneschi did commission the altarpiece named after him now in the Vatican Museum, which is also often attributed to Giotto, or at least to artists working in some way under him. It shows St. Peter enthroned, with Stefaneschi kneeling at the lower left, presenting his altarpiece to St. Peter, and then, apparently, Boniface VIII's predecessor, Pope Celestine V, is kneeling in black to the right. I'm not sure why this figure is identified as Celestine, but that Pope did do a lot to advance Stefaneschi's career. St. George, the patron saint of Giorgio Stefaneschi, is behind Stefaneschi, so there may be a clue in the saint who stands behind Celestine. In any case, Celestine himself is described by Donald Atwater as the most pathetic figure in the history of the papacy, and Donnie put him in hell for abdicating and bringing his own archenemy Boniface to power, so this is about as glorious an appearance as he ever made. You should notice the quite three-dimensional looking floor and throne, which seem to be, as far as realism goes, much more convincing than the one Giotto painted for the Madonna enthroned, which we saw last time in the Uffizi Gallery. Last time I pointed out the importance of Santa Croce in the history of 14th century painting, and there is still some much restored work by Giotto to be seen there in the Bardi and Peruzzi chapels to the right of the altar, the Bardi and Peruzzi once really amounted to something, but they made the mistake of loaning Edward III of England $80 million during the Hundred Years' War, and he never paid it back. 
This default was damaging not only to their banks, but to Florence as a whole, and it is often cited as one of the factors, along with the Black Death and the Avignon Captivity, contributing to the decline in the amount of art produced in Italy in the second half of the 14th century. The work Giotto did in these two chapels is among the last things usually attributed to him, and it was probably done about 1325. The subjects of the frescoes in the Peruzzi Chapel on the right are the lives of John the Baptist and John the Evangelist. In the Bardi Chapel, the subject is the life of St. Francis, and you see him here appearing before Malik el Kamel, the Sultan of Egypt, who was the friend of the Emperor Frederick we heard about earlier. A tolerant fellow for his age, Malik listened politely to Francis' presentation and was impressed by his willingness to submit his faith to a trial by fire, which the Muslim imam at the left was not so willing to undergo. In the imam, you can see another good example of Giotto's mastery of body language and expression, which makes him such an effective dramatist, as Kenneth Clark calls him. The fellow on the right seems to be saying, come on, the trial by fire is over here, but the imam doesn't want any part of it. Here's the death of Francis, and this is about as emotional as Renaissance art will get. The rule for most Renaissance art is don't put any more emotion into a picture than you have to in order to be consistent with the subject. The way Giotto arranges some of the figures here with their backs to the viewer, as he did in the Arena Chapel also, although I didn't point it out, helps create a real three-dimensional effect. And this device has no significant precedent in earlier painting of the late Middle Ages. <laughs> In 1334, Giotto was named Capomastro, or supervisor of the work on the cathedral, and although he did nothing that can be documented in the way of actually building it, he did make a plan for the Campanile, which was apparently at least in part carried out. He died before much of the construction could have been completed, but it has always been known as Giotto's Tower. It is nearly 300 feet high and was meant to have had a spire which would have made it perhaps the highest Campanile in Italy. As it stands, it's more than a hundred feet higher than Pisa's Leaning Tower. Several important artists contributed to the decoration of it over the years, and Giotto himself may have helped design some of the panels which Andrea Pisano made for it, and the originals of which are now in the Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. Here's Andrea Pisano's creation of Adam. Andrea was apparently from Pisa and may have been a pupil of Giovanni Pisano, although he was probably not related to him. In any case, he spent most of his adult life in Florence. I mentioned earlier this quarter that the famous motif Michelangelo uses in the creation of Adam on the Sistine ceiling, the arrangement of the hands to make it look like the spark of life is passing from one to the other, has many precedents, and this is another one. The overall subject of Andrea's panels seems to have been creation in the largest sense. And here's a figure representing painting as a creative act. Even supposing that Giotto had nothing to do with the design of the panels, it might be thought that Andrea would have modeled the figure representing painting on the greatest painter of the day. But, in fact, this looks just more like a generic old genius than a portrait of a specific person. It is, in fact, one of the earliest surviving images of a painter at work. Here's the figure representing sculpture at work. And again, one might suppose this to be perhaps a self-portrait of Andrea Pisano, but the fellow looks just like the painter. 
It's interesting to see that he's working on a statue of a nude man in the round. No comparable example of which survives from anything like the time in which this panel was done. It may be that he's in effect supposed to be a classical sculptor like, say, Praxiteles or Lysippus who did do this kind of work. So with people like Giotto, Cimabue, and Andrea Pisano all there, the 14th century was certainly an important one in the history of Florentine art, but not as important as the 15th century. The great century in the history of Florentine art is the 15th. I've already suggested that the 13th century was the Pisan century, and I think we could call the 14th the Sienese century, or at least we can say that it's the greatest century in the history of Sienese art. This is Sienna from the air now. Although the cathedral is in the center of this picture, you can see that the town hall, the Palazzo Publico down the hill, is also a very impressive building. And that suggests the increasing importance of secular life, both in the Italian Renaissance and the Renaissance generally throughout Europe, as does the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence, which was also under construction there at the same time as its cathedral, the Cathedral of Florence. There are no buildings comparable to this at Chartres or Reims or Amiens or Paris, contemporary with their great cathedrals. The upsurge in creativity of all sorts in Siena is sometimes associated with the victory the Sienese won over the Florentines at the famous Battle of Monteperti in 1260. One of the biggest and bloodiest battles of the age, the outnumbered Sienese army had 30,000 men against 70,000 Florentines. It came to take on this battle a sort of Homeric quality in Sienese tradition, and even though Florence nullified any long-term effects from her defeat at the Battle of Calais, won over the Sienese just 10 years after Monteperde, the Sienese always looked back on the victory at Monteperde, won over the Florentines, as a great thing, and one achieved by the personal intervention of the Virgin Mary herself, whom they ever thereafter regarded as the spatial protector of their city. In the cathedral, you can still see the so-called Madonna del Voto, the Virgin of the Vow, before which Bonaguida Lucari, the Sienese leader, bowed in presenting the city to her before the battle. Today, people who don't know their history tend to view the Florentines of the Renaissance as art-loving aesthetes, but their contemporaries thought of them as something closer to the Hell's Angels, a bunch of greedy bullies. This is the Palazzo Saraceni, from the tower of which the Sienese officials watched the progress of the battle. At the time of the battle, Siena was allied with the Ghibelline side, which, without going into the etymology of the word, essentially meant that they supported the German, or at least the Hohenstaufen, cause in Italy on behalf of Frederick II's son Manfred. Florence was Guelph, meaning it opposed the German cause and essentially sided with the Pope. The Guelph party was chased out of Florence after Monteperdi, but quickly restored the influence after the arrival of Charles of Anjou and the French who defeated and killed Manfred. With the defeat of the Hohenstaufen cause in Italy, Siena was deprived of its most powerful ally and was beaten, as I said, in the next battle with Florence at Calais ten years after Monteperdi. Here you can see more or less where the battle was fought with inside of the city, Donny put two of the Florentine leaders, Bocca degli Abati and Farinata degli Uberti, in hell. Bocca turned his coat in the middle of the battle, and Donny kicks him in the head when he passes by. But Farinata, who was in a lesser sense a traitor and had gone over to the Sienese side already, he didn't surprise his fellow countrymen and change his coat in the middle of the battle the way Bocca did. And then Farinata persuaded the Sienese not to attack Florence after the victory, and he's presented by Dante as a proud and still dignified figure, even in the Inferno. Although the Virgin doesn't seem to have shown Siena any particular favor after the Battle of Monteperdi, as I said, 
The Sienese always held her in especially high regard, and what is perhaps the most impressive altarpiece ever made, essentially in her honor, the famous Maya Sta, was commissioned from Duccio for the cathedral in 1308. We know of a lot of activity by him before he undertook this, but apart from the Rucella e Madonna in the same room of the Uffizi with those by Cimabue and Giotto, little has survived that can be connected to him with certainty. The Maya Sta, or Virgin in Majesty, was originally about 15 feet wide and nearly that high, and is sort of the equivalent in panel painting to Giotto's arena chapel and fresco. It's the greatest thing of its kind in the early Renaissance. If anything, it was even more highly regarded by contemporaries than the arena chapel. Duccio was paid 3,000 florins for it, about the equivalent of $150,000 today, one of the highest fees any artist has ever gotten for a work of this sort. Here you can see the Madonna and Child closer up. Certainly no work of panel painting before the Maya Sta was ever received with the acclaim according to this altarpiece. It was carried to the cathedral in a procession that included all the Sienese notables led by trumpets and drums, and three days of various sorts of celebration followed its installation in the church. In the 18th century, by which time this had come to be looked upon as primitive and crude in style, the altarpiece was dismembered, however, and the pieces sold to various collectors, and several pieces are still missing. The Musée dell'Opera del Duomo in Siena now has most of the parts, but we don't know exactly how they were all originally put together. The Museo displays them very impressively, though, in a room of their own, but essentially as independent works of art, rather than as part of what was once a whole work of art. This is the back of the main section as it is displayed in the museum. There were originally about 60 separate panels, and some have been reassembled as you see here. In Duccio, we have another eccentric artist, perhaps even more antisocial than Giotto or Cimabue, and it says a lot for the taste of the Sienese that they didn't let his many run-ins with the law deny him this commission. We know that he was fined several times for unspecified misconduct, as well as for non-payment of debts, and that he was also penalized for refusing service in the army, refusing to swear allegiance to the city government, and for sorcery. He was lucky the city of Siena didn't have a three strikes law. <laughs> Here you can see the panel representing Palm Sunday, the entry into Jerusalem. Perhaps the stage set is a little more convincing in Duccio's work than in Giotto's, but the problem of assembling convincing parts into a convincing whole is still obvious, and as I've said, it won't really be solved for another century. It's usually said that Duccio's people don't have quite the same beauty of face and form perhaps one finds in Giotto's work, Duccio's people often have a kind of angst-ridden look. This is supposed to be a happy occasion, but most of the people look worried. One commentator says these faces are clenched with anxiety. Here you can see the panel representing the Last Supper. Duccio solves the halo problem by simply leaving them off of the fellows on the near side of the table. Judas is apparently the fellow on the near side to the left with the orange cloak reaching up to take the bread from Jesus. Likewise in the scene in which Jesus takes leave of the apostles, the halos are omitted for the sake of the composition. The use of halos is not in fact consistent in the Renaissance. A lot of artists don't put them in at all. This is a beautiful room, and the apostles are all very nicely dressed. It's often said, in fact, that Sienese art is more elegant than Florentine art, more feminine maybe, but this kind of thing is difficult to quantify.
Here's the arrest of Jesus. In keeping with what I said, it's sometimes suggested that while in Giotto's work we have an analog to the theater, to drama, in Duccio one is reminded sometimes of a fine dance, an elegant sort of ballet. The figures here seem to be hardly touching the ground. They seem to be up on their toes. Here Christ is appearing before Pilate, who's so handsome and well-dressed, it's hard to believe he's the bad guy. This is the angel at the resurrection. One of Duccio's most graceful creations, but where did those wings come from? If you're an angel, I think you want to wear your best wings on Easter Sunday. And these are not in the same class as the ones Giotto paints. Also, like the people in the Palm Sunday picture, this angel looks unhappy, like she's sorry Christ has arisen. Now you see the Palazzo Publico in Siena from the air. Begun about 1290 and essentially finished some 20 years later, though the tower wasn't completed until nearly 1350. In front is the Campo, where the famous Palio horse race is run every summer. In fact, it's become so popular that they now do it twice. This is no mere show for tourists, however, and is taken very seriously in Siena. Each contrada or neighborhood sends a horse and jockey, and the latter has to ride bareback and control the horse only with a rope. No holds are barred, and the horses and jockeys all bang and crash their way around the course three times, and sometimes hardly anyone is still on his horse at the end of the race, which doesn't matter since the first horse that finishes wins, even if his jockey is unconscious in the dirt. Here you get a dramatic view of the Campanile, which is often compared to the famous, famous clenched fist tower on the Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. No one ever compared this to a clenched fist. Again, in keeping with what sometimes argued to be the more elegant character of Sienese art, this is more usually compared to, say, a lily on a stem. The guidebook to the Palazzo says that the tower is 338 feet high, which would make it higher than the clenched fist, usually said to be 308 feet high. However, the Guide Michelin says that the Siena Campanile is only 286 feet high. In any case, Duccio was probably also involved in the decoration of this building in the early 14th century, but little, if any, of his work here survives. There were, however, plenty of other important artists besides Duccio in Siena at the time. This is the Hall of Peace in the Palazzo Publico, which was frescoed in the 1330s by Ambrogio Lorenzetti. The walls you see here display the virtues of good government on the left and the consequences of good government on the right. On the other walls are the vices and consequences of bad government, which have been much vandalized over the centuries by those thinking that to remove the symbol of a thing is to help get rid of the thing itself, an oversimplification, of course, but one on which we often still act. This project of Lorenzetti's is often given several Academy Awards. It's said, for example, to be the most important secular painting commission, and the picture on the right is the most important landscape or cityscape since the fall of the Roman Empire. you can get a better look at that wall which depicts the prosperity of Siena itself under good government. It's also important to notice that this picture is devoted to ordinary people, and few Italian pictures of the next two centuries will give them so much attention. No one painted outdoors, as it were, on location in the 14th century, but I think this is probably supposed to be essentially the view up the hill toward the cathedral from the front of the Palazzo Publico 
At the upper left, you can certainly see the Campanile and dome of the cathedral. This is the view one gets looking in that direction today, and you can again see the Campanile at the upper left. The buildings around the Campo look a lot different in this photo than in Lorenzetti's picture, but Lorenzetti's goal was likely not to exactly reproduce the view. The Palazzo San Sidoni was under construction at about the time Lorenzetti painted his picture. You can see what it looks like today here, a bit farther around the Campo to the east. I want to just mention in passing that Ambrogio Lorenzetti is one of the few well-known people to have apparently died of the Black Death, which caused such a tremendous loss of life in Italy in the mid-14th century. Some think as many as a third of the whole population of the peninsula fell to this scourge, but it's odd that prominent people seem to have been immune. If Lorenzetti did die from it, he's probably the most well-known casualty, although the Florentine diarist Giovanni Villani did also apparently die from it. Otherwise, no artist, architect, sculptor, writer, composer, duke or general, to name a few categories, was lost. I'm not suggesting that it was any less serious than historians universally think it was, but this is something of an oddity. We'll hear a bit more about the Black Death when we get to Boccaccio in a while, People did have a vague feeling it was contagious, and Boccaccio's people being rich could leave town, but a lot of people who left town died anyway, and a lot who stayed obviously didn't. In this view, you can see a building that, although much smaller than the Palazzo San Sidoni as it stands today, does bear some resemblance to it. Also, there is construction work going on above and to the right, which some think might be work on the cathedral, but I don't think so. It's too far away from the Campanile and Dome off screen at the left. Maybe it's supposed to be work on the Palazzo San Sidoni. Although, also seems too far from the Campo for that. It is, however, likely that the Campo was smaller in the 14th century, with buildings standing much closer to the Palazzo Publico than they do today. Notice how many tower houses, too, there are in this picture. Few Italian cities have many of these left, but we'll visit San Gimignano eventually, and it's famous primarily for the number of these still standing. While we see a little more of this picture up closer, we'll hear a popular Renaissance dance piece called In Pro. <laughs> dancing going on in what I suppose to be the campo today. These look like women who could be wearing costumes from the 1920s. Looking at the wall in one of the city gates, the gate to the east now. And out into the countryside, the winged figure at the upper left is holding an inscription which reads, if you don't obey the dictates of good government, you'll face the consequences. And this is what it actually looks like now, east of Siena. Another of the great Sienese artists who helped decorate the Palazzo Publico was Simone Martini. 
And until about 1980, pretty much everyone agreed that this picture, said to be a portrait of the Sienese condottieri Guidericcio de Foliano, was a masterpiece by Simoni. It was thought that he was honored with this because of his successful conquest of the two cities you see in the background. If the date, 1328, on the frame is correct, this is the most impressive portrait painted since the fall of Rome, and it is also, if not as impressive as Lorenzetti's slightly later picture of Siena in the Hall of Peace, another of the earliest Renaissance landscapes. The picture always reminds me a little bit of Durr's Night Devil and Death, the lone hero in a hostile environment just keeping focused on what's straight ahead of him, no time for distractions. This isn't the way we usually imagine Tuscany, the storied land of song and cookbooks, to look, though. It looks more like Guidariccio on the moon. Nor does Guidariccio look really very military here, either. He looks a bit more like a portly bank manager dressed up for a parade. Be that as it may, as I said, pretty much the whole art historical community, and a fortiori the Sienese branch, took it for granted that this was Guidariccio painted in 1328 by Simone. Then in 1977, Gordon Moran, an American stockbroker who was an amateur art historian, retired from Wall Street to pursue his interest in Sienese art in Siena itself and set off what can only be called a storm of controversy by questioning the whole traditional view of this picture. Art historians are not less concerned about reputation than other men, and his arguments have certainly threatened many and have led to all sorts of unedifying vilification and name-calling on both sides. It didn't help that he was an American stockbroker and the government of Siena at the time he began publicizing his theories had a communist mayor. Here you can see the way the wall on which this picture is painted looked in 1980. I'm not going to go into the controversy in any detail, but the bottom line is that about the only people who are still certain this is a painting of Guidariccio de Foliano by Simone Martini in 1328 are in rest homes in Siena. For one thing, Moran discovered that Guidariccio was kicked out of town after the date on the picture, which makes its survival after that date a puzzle. We wouldn't keep pictures of Benedict Arnold in post offices even if they were by Rembrandt. Also, the fact that the painting is not even mentioned before the 18th century is suspicious, as is the fact that it seems to overlap the 16th century paintings below it. Moran was at least able to get the authorities to do some digging under the surface of the lower wall. And this is the way that wall looks now. Some think it depicts the lower picture now, the real Guidariccio, maybe by Simone Martini, accepting the surrender of the cities in question, and that it was plastered over after his banishment. In the 15th century, a rotating map called the Mappamondo was fixed to the wall, and the hole for the spindle can still be seen, as well as the scars made by the circular map in the picture under it. Some think the figure above was painted at the same time to represent something like power, but it is still odd that there's no mention of it until 200 years later. Here's the newly uncovered figure below, which some have attributed not to Simone, but to Duccio, or some other Sienese artist. You can almost take your pick. Several have been chosen as possibilities. Once upon a time, someone brought an alleged Duccio to Bernard Berenson to ask him for his opinion about the attribution. Berenson just took one quick look at it and said, Nope, not Duccio. When the picture's owner asked him how he could be so certain so quickly, he said, If it were a Duccio, I would have swooned. Too bad we just can't put Berenson in front of this and see if he faints because in lieu of any real documentary evidence, there's going to be argument over all this for many years. It's the kind of thing I enjoy seeing go on in art history because it illustrates the point on which pretty much my whole career has been based. That is, what a work of art actually looks like counts for almost nothing compared to its historical value. 
its value as a souvenir. The argument isn't over whether the would-be Guidariccio above this is a beautiful picture or an impressive work of art or anything like that. The argument is over whether or not it's a genuine souvenir of the greatest century in the history of Siena. That Simone Martini painted the Madonna enthroned at the other end of this room has never been questioned, and you see it now. Just as Duccio's altarpiece is arguably the most impressive such altarpiece ever devoted to the Virgin, one could claim even more easily that this is the most impressive fresco ever to depict her as the central figure. Remember I said earlier that in no city has she ever been more important as an inspiration for artists, and these two works certainly support that view. Here's that fresco up closer now. Some see French influence here, and Simone did eventually go at least as far into France as Avignon, but not before he painted this around 1315. He could have seen examples of French art in Naples, though, which was controlled, remember, by the French House of Anjou at this time. The very Gothic-looking throne in the more graceful figure of the Virgin Mary, and those of the other saints as well, seem to uh, some to be more like the work being done at this time in France. She's certainly less Earth Mother-like than the enthroned Madonnas by Cimabue and Giotto we saw last time. It's also significant that the earliest surviving altarpiece to use the Annunciation as its subject was painted in Siena again by Simone Martini. It's now in the Uffizi to the chagrin of the Sienese who would very much like to have it back. Here the Virgin is about as slim and delicate as a human figure can get. It's important to notice the frames of works like this too. We usually think of a painting as something which comes in a frame from which it could be removed. In the Renaissance, however, the frames of altarpieces like this were usually considered an integral part of the whole ensemble. The painter was, in fact, often responsible for making the frames as well. As late as the 16th century, artists of even the caliber of Michelangelo and Albrecht Dürer made frames for their own pictures. In some cases, especially in Flanders, we know of frame makers and woodworkers being paid even more than painters for their part in an altarpiece. Here you can see the center of this work up closer. The Virgin looks kind of like a blonde porcelain doll with a distinctly Asiatic cast to her features. Over the centuries, the Virgin will be shown reacting in various ways to Gabriel's message, and here she looks distinctly offended by it, or by him. It looks like he's just touched down here with his scotch plaid cape still fluttering behind him. Although the lilies, which were always associated with the Virgin, are prominent in a vase, it may be significant that Gabriel holds the olive branch, which was viewed as a symbol of Siena, rather than the lily, which was associated with Florence, and which he typically holds in Florentine versions of the subject. Here's St. Louis of Toulouse, painted by Simone Martini, probably when he was in Naples in 1315. Louis is shown giving the crown of Naples to his younger brother Robert, known as the Wise. They were the grandsons of that Charles d'Anjou, about whom we heard a few lectures ago, who defeated the Hohenstaufens, Manfred and Corradino, and then established the Angevin dynasty in Naples back in the 13th century. Louis gave up the throne to become a Franciscan monk and bishop of Toulouse, and he's wearing the robes of the order tied with the triple knotted cord under his bishop's robes. Robert himself became quite a patron of the arts, and Petro, Bo Petrarch, Boccaccio, the composer Adam de la Hall, Giotto, and Simone all worked for him at one time or another. 
Louis himself became famous for actually giving up this throne for the church and is often depicted among the most important Franciscans and other works of art. He's also well known to Californians under his name as, under his Spanish name as uh, San Luis Obispo. If the alleged Guidariccio in Siena is not really Guidariccio and not really by Simone, this is perhaps the earliest surviving painted portrait since the fall of Rome, and no one has questioned its attribution to, to Simone. It's still in Naples in the Capodimonte Museum. This is the building now called Dotti's House in Florence. And this is where we'll take the break. When we come back, we'll hear about the greatest writers in Italian literary history, all of whom did their work in the 14th century. Dotti, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, 